Hi guys, uh, good afternoon. My name is Dominic Quack. I am a creature and character artist. I work for Blizzard Entertainment as a senior cinematic artist. Today, I am going to talk to you guys about um, my workflow for creating my own collectibles and, and um, busts. Right? But before I do that, I want to give you guys a quick introduction to my work. So these are some of my professional works. Um, I do mostly characters at work, and I've, I've been working in the games industry for about seven to eight years now. Um, and then before that, I was working for the broadcast industry. Um, these are some of my creature designs. Um, all of these are personal art. So I, as you can see, I really love aliens, a lot of alien designs. Um, you can see he has that cool lightsaber thingy. But yeah, all of this was sculpted in ZBrush. And none of them required a base mesh, right? The way we work now in ZBrush is that with DynaMesh, you don't need a base mesh anymore. And I'll show you guys in just a bit how I go about doing that. Um, I call this guy the deep shrimp, evil shrimp. So if you guys like seafood. Um, this is my kaiju right after watching Pacific Rim. I was super inspired. I uh, decided to do my own kaiju. More creatures. This is um, Jawsome from Last Man Standing. Um, it's actually a graphic novel by Dan Luvisi. Um, some more creature designs. Some HR Giga inspired spacecraft. But today I'm going to talk specifically about some of my 3D prints. All of these um, were printed in 3D and then I had resin copies made. So this presentation is going to be focused on how I go about creating these busts. Um, and if we have the time, I'll also touch a bit on how to create cuts and keys um, so that you can fit your pieces together. Um, so yeah, these are some of the resin kits that I've released over the past two to three years. This is the very first one I made, um, four inches tall. And I believe this was printed using stereolithography. And, and when I got this for the first time, I was so amazed with 3D printing, right? And this pretty much got, got me hooked for the next three years. Um, I made resin copies. I don't, I don't do the molding and casting. I get someone else to do it for me. I, I made more. I sold them. And I believe as an artist, it's important to, to put your work out there because um, that's how you create value to yourself as an artist, is to give yourself um, the freedom to create your own IP. So these are more creatures. Um, printed this in 3D as well. This is about eight to nine inches tall. Uh, made a couple of castings. This is resin. Um, this is translucent resin. So um, what, you, what you guys may not know that uh, there's this model kit scene, right? Like back 10 years ago, it was pretty popular. I guess these days people don't really do garage kits anymore, but there are painters out there who buy these castings and then they paint. They paint on them. And the reason why I did a translucent casting is because they can um, use the airbrush and create um, skin effect, like um, subsurface scattering. So this was pretty interesting. Um, and, and I lit the one on the right. I, I had a torchlight behind just to show you guys the amount of translucence in the resin casting. So this is a painted version. Um, this is another guy I did, uh, Hopper. I'm not sure if you guys know the work of Takeya Takayuki, um, inspired by Kamen Rider and, and that kind of stuff. So I did the same, um, printed it. This is a lot smaller, six inches tall. And, um, and this was the first time I was actually um, printing multiple parts, right? So the feelers on his head, um, those actually come off. So this is a painted version, again. Uh, I don't paint any of this. What I do is um, I actually have a painter paint it for me. So it, it's really cool as a, as a 3D artist to be able to, to see your own creations, you know, from, from starting out in digital and then moving towards the physical realm. And, and I believe 3D printing has sort of jump-started this revolution. You see a lot of um, digital sculptors actually um, printing their own stuff out, and it's just amazing. Uh, this is one of the biggest pieces I've um, printed. I call this guy Rakshasa. He's about 11 inches tall. Um, printed in multiple parts. The arms had to be broken apart. His lower jaw had to come off. His tongue had to be a separate part. And uh, this is just a quick 
indication of where I wanted the seam lines to be. So this is the actual 3D print uh, that Campbell suit for size reference. My 3D printer guy likes to use this for size reference for some absurd reason. Maybe it's some reference to Andy Warhol. Uh, this is the resin casting, um, five parts. And you can see uh, there are some joints over here. And uh, I'll, show you, I'll show you guys in a bit how I go about creating that. This was actually created by Onage, the, the company that printed for me. These are some painted versions. Uh, again, I'm, I'm just like getting, asking painters, hey, do you want to paint uh, a version for me? And they go, yeah, you know. I mean, in exchange, I, they get a copy free, you know, and then I get a painted version. So it's win-win it's for the both of us. So the one on the left, this is painted by Phil Serra, and this over here, the darker one, that's painted by Rick Cantu, both extremely talented painters. And this is Gilman, one of, this is my latest um, print. You can see it on the booth over there. I brought it in. Um, and this is almost one-third scale, um, and it's the biggest bus I've ever printed. Um, and this, this was a very interesting, interesting experience because never done anything this big, so I wanted something that, that, that was big enough to, so that I can contain all of that detail into this sculpt. Uh, this is for size reference. It's a bad idea, but now my cats are famous. But so if you, this is the 3D print. Um, you can see it really captured all the detail. I mean, if you went back five to six years, I don't think we would be able to get this kind of quality um, for the amount of money you pay for, right? I, and I didn't pay anything crazy for this. I didn't pay a few thousand dollars, just, just to let you guys know. Um, and, and the price of 3D printing is getting cheaper and cheaper, and, and that's why you see more and more people hopping onto this new bandwagon. Um, different castings, um, playing with different materials. I believe that's, um, that's resin. I think that's alabaster, plaster or something. Um, but it's just interesting to, to feel um, how different materials actually affect your final casting. This is a painted version, another painted version. So a good friend of mine, Zach Podretz, he, um, he helped me took these photos as well. So before I start, I'm just going to go through some of the brushes I use. I don't use that many brushes, to be honest. Um, these are some of the few I use, the clay build-up, clay, form soft, Damien standard, trim dynamic, which is just another kind of flatten, right? I've got a gravity brush, and what a gravity brush does is it's just a standard brush, but with a gravity setting to it. So it's really good for stuff like adding weight, adding weight to wrinkles and things like that. I've got my move, and then my favorite brush of all, the snake hook brush, right? And if you, and if you notice, I have all my brushes hot keyed. Um, and there's a reason for doing this, right? Because um, it, it doesn't take me a long time to access these brushes. Since I'm using that so much, I have them hotkeyed to the numbers one to six so that I can access them really quickly. Okay. So let's jump right into ZBrush. And I always like to start with a blank sphere because this feels like a blank canvas to me, right? So first thing you do, you create a sphere. And I'm going to try to... Um, quickly create what I did during the sculpt off. Um, I've, I have another file that's already saved, so in case we run out of time, I can always hop to that, that saved file. But as I was saying, um, with ZBrush, you do not need a base mesh anymore, right? First thing you do, make it a, make, make it a poly mesh 3D, and then you can go to Dyno Mesh and set a resolution. When you do that, you see it automatically redistributes the, the topology, right? And it does that by analyzing the surface detail. So if you have, let's say, if you have that inset over there, it's going to compensate for that stretching. And all I have to do is to just hit Control and then just drag. See how it re topologize over there? So that's the, the basis of all the sculpts I do. In fact, it's, it's, if, if it's anything organic, that's pretty much how you start out. Right, so I'm just going to go through really quickly how I create the basic shapes. I have, um, let me touch on my UI first, right? This is a customized UI. Um, these are the brushes I use most often. 
I have all of this um, hotkey, as you can see. And if you want to change the hotkey for one of these, all you have to do is hit Control Alt, and then click on it. And then you can see over here, it, it immediately prompts you to uh, press a uh, shortcut key for this brush. So this is my gravity, and then I believe that goes to Shift 1, right? Um, so that's, that's a quick way of um, assigning hotkeys in ZBrush. So I'm going to use my move brush. I'm just going to quickly nudge this into shape, right? I am going to just focus on creating maybe like just a quick bus, um, probably another alien because I'm obsessed with them. Um, and I hope you guys can see as I'm switching between the different brushes, right? I'm not clicking on them, I'm just using my hotkeys. Then you can use the Trim Dynamic, the Flatten Brush. And it's, it's sort of like a rake tool. If any of you guys do um, traditional sculpting, it sort of like flattens the, the, the planes of your model. So once I have something that I like, you'll see me constantly redynamashing. And there are some settings to play with over here, right? So let me go through them. This resolution determines how much, poly how much um, polygons show up here. So if I increase this, increase this to 256, you're going to see a lot more polygons. Right? Blur actually adds a blur. Project actually um, reprojects existing detail. So if I check this off and I start adding detail, it's going to lose some of that detail. It's going to soften everything up. So when I start out, um, this is different for every artist. I like to start out with a pretty low resolution setting um, because I feel that this actually lets me um, manage my, my model a lot better. Some artists are great with um, working with high resolution. That, that's fine by you. That's fine by me. You know, whatever works for you. But I just like how my model reacts to my brushes at a low resolution. So this is going to be some kind of um, crustacean, I believe. And I just want to show you guys how quick it is to do a quick creature in ZBrush, right? So let's go through some of the brushes I use. The clay buildup is just it layers volume onto your model, and then you'll see me always redynamashing. The Damien standard, two ways of using it. If you hit Alt, it's going to do the inverse. Right? So the Damien standard is great for creating cuts in your model. Um, on the other hand, if you want, if you want um, a ridge to stick out over here, you can use the Damien standard and hit Alt instead. You see, it's going to give me that rich, nice, rich effect. And I'm not concerned about the stretching, right? Because I can always re it. So then my favorite brush of all time, the snake hook brush. This guy over here. And the reason why I love it, because it lets me just drag out forms. like It's almost like butter. So if I wanted, let's say, um, spikes to stick out from the side, right? I can use a snake hook brush and quickly yank those out. Again, not concerned about the topology. I just re mesh and I've got new topology to work with. And you can see I'm still working at a very low resolution. Um, the, as I add more detail um, and I feel like the amount of detail I have on my model um, is starting to look very pixelated, what I, what I normally do is to start increasing the resolution detail, right? And when I do that, it's going to redistribute additional resolution all over the model.
So you can see I'm just using those same few brushes. Um, another thing you can do is using the gravity brush, you can add weight to skin um, or any kind of wrinkles. So I'm using the gravity brush now. You can see it's slowly weighing down that volume over there. And you can do this with um, wrinkles as well. So if I have, let's say, um, I'm going to use the Damien standard brush. I'm going to cut some wrinkles, let's say, around here. Right? I'm going to soften this a bit. And you soften by hitting shift. So that automatically switches to your soften brush. Then I'm going to use the gravity brush and I'm going to start adding some weight. And then you can crisscross over existing creases. Right? So this that's basically some of the brushes I use. Um, what you can do as well is um, you can add this new feature in ZBrush. Uh, I think it came out in ZBrush R5. So if you hit B, that's going to let you access all the brushes in ZBrush. And then um, you can hit C, that's going to let you access all the curved brushes, right? And these are uh, a whole suite of really powerful tools that lets you create additional geometry. And when used together with DynaMesh, you can create a lot of really cool forms. So I'm going to start out by choosing Curve Tube Snap, and what, that's, what that does is it's going to create um, a tube along the surface of my model. So I'm just dragging it over, it's going to create a tube like that, right? And you can see when I have it hover, I can adjust the curve, I can have it tucked in, right? Or if I wanted this to be bigger, I can make, making sure I'm not I don't have this green cursor, making sure I have the red cursor, I can increase my draw size and click onto it. Right? So you guys can see already how, how quickly it is to create forms in, in ZBrush. So I'm going to have these two meet because when I read DynaMesh, that geo is going to combine with my existing model. Um, some other things you can do with um, the curve tubes is you can under stroke and under curve modifiers you can adjust the size, right? So this is actually a graph that controls the size throughout that curve. So this is the start of your curve, that's the end of your curve. So I want the start of my curve, which is this guy over here, I want it to be thicker, and then I want it to taper off, right? So once I have that, make sure I have size checked on, I'm just gonna click, right? So that's a really cool way of like adding more shapes to your model. So once, once I have that, I'm going to switch back to my brushes, my standard brushes again. I'm going to delete that curve and then I can start moving this into place. And let's say I'm, I'm happy with this. I'm going to do the same. I'm going to hit control and re -dynamesh. See that gave us that nice ridge along the edges. So there are a couple of other things you can do as well. Um, Let's take a look. You can use the curve quad fill, and this is going to create a plane, right? And let's see if we can figure out something cool. Maybe something like that. And then again, I can, I can use my I can use my size brush, I can adjust the thickness, right, if I want something that's thin. And then once I have that, I'm going to delete my curve. And I'm going to start positioning this guy so that it works better. Um, but you can see that curve quad fill lets us create quick, quick um, armor plates, right? And uh, I wanted to show you guys this really cool trick. I can create, let's say, a wing like that. I can use my transpose line, and transpose line is basically the way you move um, geometry around in ZBrush, right? So with my transpose line on, um, I can hold on to control and then drag it out. So that is immediately duplicating 
that new geo. So I'm going to redynamesh it, and all of that is going to blend in really well. Right, so that's just some of the ways you can create new forms in ZBrush, right? You can use standard brushes, um, and there's a whole bunch of other brushes that are really, really powerful. Or you could use um, insert mesh, insert curves, which is what I just did. You can use um, curve tubes. Or you can use um, insert mesh. So insert mesh is a whole series of, of assets, right? So let's say insert mesh body parts. So once I have this brush selected, right, I can hit M. That's going to let me access a whole suite of brushes within ZBrush. And all, all these are stock, right? They come with ZBrush, right? So what if I wanted um, really sexy lips? And uh, let's say he has really nice pair of lips over here, like that, right? Right? This is kind of creepy, but you guys get the point. Then I can read Dynamesh. That's going to merge that asset into my, the rest of my model, right? So I'm just going to jump ahead. I'm going to load a file that I already have. That, that was just to give you guys a quick idea of how I create the basic forms and the basic shapes in ZBrush. I mean, later on, we're going to touch a bit on adding detail, but for most parts, I stick to insert mesh, insert mesh brushes, curved tubes, and the standard brushes in ZBrush. <laughs> Thank you.